difference between what can be and what appears to be essentially. And human beings have a tendency, we, have, we are willing to suspend our disbelief essentially, we are willing to watch a James Bond movie and believe that all that is happening is possible and all kinds of things essentially. So, the fact that a man made artifact could respond to human input easily leads humans to take a leap of faith and conclude that it responds intelligently and knowledgeably. Throughout centuries we have been doing that essentially. So, in olden times in Egypt people believe that statues which moved and gestured had a sort of a soul and they could represent a god or a dead person and communicate through a priest essentially. So, I said olden times Egypt, but even today you can find in our country this sort of a thing happening. You know you have people who read tea leaves or people who communi communicate with your ancestors or people who go and get their fortunes foretold by a parrot who pulls a card out of a bunch of cards. So, we do it all the time and we believe, well not everybody, but we mostly believe that this, this is possible essentially. Such practices continue to this day essentially. And in Europe, there was a great fascination for such moving figures, moving automata, automata or you know statues which could move around and shake their heads and so on. So, Pamela McCulloch writes in her book Machines Who Think that in medieval times the art of making clocks decorated and animate figures were very popular essentially. So, if you go to Germany, you can still find them for example, uh, in clock towers uh, when it is 12 noon, suddenly there is a lot of music and some statues come out and do something and go back in that kind of stuff. So, it was popular in, med in medieval times that learned men kept robots essentially. Okay. By learned men, you know, society was not very as egalitarian as it was now, they were the kings and they were the peasants and they were the learned men and they were the traders and the warriors. So, there were classes of people, those learned men kept robots. And most interestingly to most people, there could be little difference between a human figure that nodded, bowed, marched or struck a gong at a precise and predictable moment, which is entirely feasible. You can construct, construct machinery which is accurate and we know that such machinery exists. So, between such machinery and a human figure that answered naughty questions and foretold the future. So, for us there is no difference. If we can construct a statue which can nod its head and we ask a question and it nods its head, we are willing to say that yes, it understands what I am saying and it is telling my future and you know that sort of a thing. So, in the study of history that we are going to be doing, there are going to be two strands. One is this mechanical side of talking statues, moving statues and things like that and the other is going to be the philosophical side which is about what is the notion of the mind, how did the notion of the mind come, you know. I'm, so, those questions will come to a little bit later, let us first address the mechanical side of things essentially. So, all this is happening in Europe, we have this notion of artificial people in Homer's Iliad, uh, Hephaestus is supposed to have created this Talos, a man of bronze to, which would patrol the beaches of Crete. Hephaestus is also supposed to have created Pandora, you might have heard about Pandora who commissioned by Zeus. So, Zeus was a god to punish mankind for accepting Prometheus gifts of fire and Pandora is supposed to take that casket, but she is so curious about it that she opens the casket essentially. No, and, and let us lose the evils into this world essentially. Pygmalion, Pygmalion, remember this Bernard Shaw's play called Pygmalion in which there was a character called Eliza, which was the name of the program written by Weizenbaum. Pygmalion also was a mythic, mythical creature who was disappointed by real women and created Galati in ivory and Aphrodite who was another god. So, the Greeks also had many gods like we Indians have you know gods for doing different kinds of things. Obliges him by breathing life into Galatea and apparently he fell in love with his own creation. 
like in the play. And then Daedalus you must have heard about more well known for his artificial wings, he, was, he wanted to fly, but he was also create, credited with creating lifelike statues that wheezed and blinked and scuttled about impressing everyone. So, this is a important thing, the statues which could seem to be autonomous and if you are autonomous, you must be intelligent essentially. So, that is a leap of faith that we are making essentially. Then about a thousand years ago, Pope Sylvester is said to have made a statue with a talking head with a limited vocabulary and a penchant for predicting the future. So, that is why people are willing to believe that this talking head can tell you your future and on being asked a query, it would reply yes or no by shaking its head essentially. But all that is in myth essentially. There is some more mythology. Paracelsus who was a physician who lived from 1493 to 1541 is supposed to have created a little man called Humunculus essentially. Okay. And he made this statement, we shall be like gods, we shall duplicate gods greatest miracle the creation of man essentially. Because in western thought, we have been created in the image of God himself essentially and so we can be like him and create creatures in our own image so to speak. So, he lived in Switzerland and Rabbi Judah Lovin is supposed to have sculpted a loom human, a living man from clay and he called it Golem to defend the Jews of Prague. So, in Jewish folklore a Golem is an animated anthropomorphic, anthropomorphic creature made out of an inanimate matter. So, that is the kind of a image, the kind of creature he is supposed to have created essentially. All this material that is available in Wikipedia and I have given all the references from where I have taken the images. So, let us talk about real mechanisms or some of them are mythical. Of course, we cannot imagine a man made of clay which could do all this sort of things, but in parallel real machinery was being created essentially. Some of these ideas came from the east via the Arabian countries. And in 802, Harun ul Rashid, you know, we heard his name in other contexts as well, is said to have presented Emperor Charlemagne with an elaborate clock which sent out dozens of cavaliers from a dozen windows each and back again. So, this is a kind of clockwork which, if you go to Europe, uh, you can still see now essentially in, this, in the town hall or city center, we have this sort of machinery still operating. Then a group of Arab astrologers is credited with constructing what they call as a thinking machine called the Zayarja, which was dis designed. So, it was it was a collection of rotating disks, you know, with markings on them and if you rotated the disk according to some input information, you would compute something. But their notion was to generate ideas by mechanical means with the help of a technique of breaking down called Al Jabru, which as some of you know is the root for the word algebra. And by combining numbers values associated with letters and categories, new paths of insight and thought could be created essentially. So, this fascination of autonomous entities, autonomous machines which are thinking machines goes back a long time essentially. So, this Zerza caught the imagination of a Spanish Catalonian missionary called Ramon Lull and who decided to design a Christian version of it which he calls as Ars Magna and he said the goal is to bring reason to bear on all subjects and in this way arrive at the truth without the trouble of thinking or fact finding essentially. So, one thing when you look at the quotations from these times you must remember that some of the meanings of the words are a little bit different from what they are now essentially. For those of you who have read Shakespeare for example would know that Shakespeare's English is a little bit different from ours English and our English and we need to understand things essentially. But this notion of arriving at truth without the trouble of thinking or fact finding of course, uh, has been fulfilled now with 
programs like Google and so on. You just have to type in something and you get an answer essentially. Right? So by the middle of the 14th century, large clocks and figures became popular in many areas of Germany and Italy and talking brass heads became closely associated with learned men again essentially. The Archbishop of Salzburg built a working model of a complete miniature town driven by water power essentially, operated by water power from a nearby stream essentially. So, one or two more examples. So, Vaconsen's duck. So, Vaconsen, so you keep note that years, this was he, he was, he made this thing in around 1730 or something like that, which is quite long time ago. He was a French inventor. So, one, he is credited with having made an android which could serve dinner and clear tables for the visiting politicians. However, one government official declared that he thought Vaconsen's tendencies as profane and ordered his workshop to be destroyed essentially. We will see later that this kind of political oversight has influenced European thought quite a bit, political and religious oversight. So, for example, Copernicus and Galileo and all these people were sort of worried about putting forward their ideas about what the world is really like. So, he created this, his most famous creation is this duck called the mechanical duck which could appear to be drinking, eating, quacking, splashing about in water and digesting its food essentially and became very famous 1739. And there is an image of the replica of this duck which is lying in some museum, some, some museum somewhere. So, of course, in, in real life meaning in the actual duck that he created, it did not have digestive abilities. Uh, uh, the food was actually collected in the food that the duck was supposed to be eating was collected in one container and the output was sort of pre-stored and sent out from another container. But he was hopeful that a truly digesting automaton could one day be designed essentially. So, this fascination with machinery is that is what we are trying to look at essentially. Uh, another very famous example is this chess playing Turk by Kempelen, Wolfgang Kempelen, 1734-184. He created a chess playing machine known as a mechanical Turk constructed in 1770 to impress the Empress Maria Theresa of Australia. And the mechanism appeared to be able to play a strong game of chess against human opponents as well as perform the knight's tour. So, you must be familiar with the knight's tour uh, on a 64 board chess square. Can you move a knight to cover all the squares exactly once? And the figure on the bottom is a knight's tour apparently created by the mechanical Turk. It looks quite a aesthetic figure to me. I think you might have written a program to create a knight's tour at some point. Now, this was a automaton which Campellan took all over Europe. He, he impressed uh, Napoleon uh, and other people beating his general at chess. Uh, and here is a picture of the automaton. You can see it. Exactly. Maybe I should have made it a bit larger. Uh, so, if you look carefully, you can see that inside this box was a human chess players <coughs> sitting there. So, it was really a hoax essentially, but it was not discovered for a long time essentially. And it travelled <coughs> for nearly 84 years, Europe and America beating all kinds of luminaries at chess essentially. It seems Edgar Allan Poe wrote an essay trying to expose that this chess player cannot be a real machine. Okay, so, let us move on to more useful things. Uh, mechanical arithmetic, can we make machines which will do arithmetic for us? So, Pascal of course, you are familiar with uh, as students of science uh, in various places, Pascal's name has appeared, uh, not least as a programming language, name of a programming language. 
So, he invented a mechanical calculator using something called lantern gears which we will not go into and he tried out 50 different prototypes before presenting his machine in 1645 to the public. It was called Pascaline or arithmetic machine or Pascal's calculator and it could add and subtract two numbers that was its limits of its mental abilities and multiply and divide by repetition essentially.